Well, hello there, friend. So for those of you who watch our YouTube videos, we had an unedited meeting last week where we talked about our YouTube strategy. And one of those things was getting rid of the video side of our podcast. But alas, here I am doing video, talking to you, and we're gonna continue to do video. But we are gonna do it differently. We're just gonna do it kind of unedited meeting style. And if you've watched those before, if you're on listening on the podcast, you're like, what does this mean? It doesn't matter. You could probably hit the fast forward 30 seconds button and it won't matter, but you will hear us talk about this. Anywho, long story short, we discussed in the beginning of this video, my hangups with doing uh, video and production and other things related to the show. And we're just gonna keep it simple. We're gonna still do video, but we're gonna do it really, really easy for me. I don't have to spend a lot of hours editing. I'm gonna spend that time doing other stuff, which you'll actually hear about in this episode of Fun Project that we are kicking off this week. So anyway, without further ado, we have video with our show still. We, this podcast is gonna be the same as we've been talking about it being, um, but just a little bit less production and focusing that time on other fun projects. So anyway, this may not matter to you, but for those of you who gave us feedback, it was really helpful. This is what we're gonna do moving forward, I think, until we change it again. Who knows, we're just wandering aimfully. This is our ethos, this is what we do. Anywho, enjoy. Hey there, we're Jason and Caroline Zook, a husband and wife team who believes life is just one big experiment. This is the show where we share our journey as we figure out this ever-changing thing called life. We cover topics like running a business, traveling the world, and clawing our way out of debt, all with the hope of inspiring you to live, work, and create with more intention. Life might bring its twists and turns, but when you know who you are and what you want, you're never really lost. Welcome to Wandering Aimfully, the show. Welcome back to Wandering Aimfully, the show, everybody. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Most importantly, me. I got some acknowledgments that were in the fart studio. Yeah. And I'm very, that's be a thing now. very excited that we got acknowledgments about that. I mean, if you didn't listen to the last episode, I set up Caroline's uh, Amazon Echo, which is in her fart studio. <laughs> and uh, I named it when she wasn't looking Carol's Fart, fart Studio. studio. Lol. Lol. <laughs> and so when we ask it what its name is, that's what it we says. We can do it right now. You won't be able to hear it. It's too far away. Oh. When I listened to the audio last week, you, it's like, she's like this. She's just so oh. quiet. Yeah. So it's not, it's just not yeah. quite. So welcome enough. to that inside joke. Yeah. Uh, okay. Also, second uh, piece of housekeeping. There's, p- there's potentially video. So I'll cut this part out oh. if I decide not to use the video, if I watch this back and I don't use it. But if I leave it in, then you know that the feedback on last week's YouTube strategy video and all the things that we talked about mostly me hemming and hawing about all the things. A bunch of people commented and you guys all said that you liked when we just do kind of informal recording. We use our personalities to banter back and forth. Oh, look at you. Oh, what'd you say? Don't say that about me. This you're is so, banter. You're so weird. What is what is banter when you think about it? I guess you have to like, Where touch does it come from? banter. And we listen to your feedback. And I specifically am taking this to mean that we don't have to do super in-depth video stuff, especially right now where like we are. Highly edited is yeah. the and when produced, you say in-depth. And produced. I know. I'm yeah, I saying, look at it as both. Sure. Yeah. But I challenge us. This is maybe, future us or is present us? Because we could get into some time this paradoxes is us. here. Oh, see, I did it like this. Yeah, I know. But this is us. We talk about this sometimes, so maybe we'll do a whole episode on this. But a lot of times, what you see in, for example, YouTubers, because that's the best like example I can give, is somebody starts out and they just start recording their life and they're being raw and they're being honest and they're just sort of imperfect. But over time they start to gain an audience. And so they think they have to become more professional, more edited, more highly produced. But the funny thing is the more you add in those things, kind of the less connection I think sometimes your audience feels with the person behind the camera. And it's sort of the creator's dilemma is like, do I keep improving the end product And if I do that, does it remove some of the magic of what got me started in the first place? And I think that's an important lesson for us to keep in mind, which is that I have this suspicion that people are not around. I mean, the editing's great and it's fun and it keeps people entertained. And it's also a thing that you love doing. So there's that as well. But I I challenge us. Like, I think we have this mindset that because we've been doing this for years that we shouldn't be like seem like amateurs anymore, but I think sometimes the the magic is in being an amateur. And so I challenge us to (laughs) lower our bar just a little bit on quality and production and everything just so that we can. Yeah. Well, first of all, highly distracted because 
dog fart. <laughs> really? It, it is the fart Woo! studio. Wow, I tried to just kind of like tough it out. You know, <laughs> you know, sometimes you're in conversation, you I just want to tough it out. <laughs> I did see you blinking a lot. <laughs> so like, I it think- It was pungent. I think it affected your eyes. Pungent. Um, for those of you listening in and not watching, Oh, That's man. a new video. Plaxico is between us yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. and so yeah. he just let one rip. This is the beauty of the fart studio for him, is that every episode he gets to be smooshed in the middle on some pillows. I also thought it could be fun, as this show progresses, I want to get back to your point, uh, keyword, I wear your shirt, is that I want, like, eventually there just to be, like, 12 body pillows, and it's just all you, like, if we have <laughs> video, it's just you can barely see our stocking, because there's so many yeah. pillows. which is, like, when we have cleaners that come to clean our house every other week and they make the bed, which is the only time the bed gets made, but they stack yeah. all of our throw pillows yeah. nice, nicely. And sometimes you'll be like, where's Plax? Like, I, we, yeah. did we leave him outside? Yeah. Like what happened? And you'll go in and he is so deeply buried in the stack of throw pillows that yeah. you didn't know he was there. Yeah, and some of the colors are kind of the same as his colors, yeah. black and white. So you, you look and you're like, I mean, I know he's in there, but I can't even really see him. It's okay. so great. Let me come back to this because I don't want to stay too long in this topic because we do have some other stuff we want to talk about. Sure. But I think the advice is all well and good of start imperfectly, don't overproduce, don't do these things when you don't have a whole lot of baggage attached. So I have a lot of baggage attached with video. I myself have made at least at least 1,600 videos. Yes, that's a lot. So I started, I already did the like, I'm really crappy at video. You can go back and find the very early 2009 videos that I did. They're awful, they're really bad, but there is that charm to them, right? Like, you, especially if you were there at that time and you've stuck around, you've, you've watched the evolution and everything else. And so I do have some hangups of, let's just record and just like kind of lean on our personalities and do that. Whereas I go, yeah, but I also have learned all these things that I can do with cameras. I also really appreciate these things about the people that I watch on YouTube, and I'd like to do some of those things. So that was gonna be my question is what is the hang up? And it hears like, it hears like, <laughs> it sounds like what you're saying is that the hang up lies in knowing that you have the skill set. Yeah. And choosing not to use the skill set is hard for you. Yeah, it's it, like, I think about it in this moment of imagine you're a, a Michelin star chef. But yet you go and you just buy like of like microwavable meals, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, yeah, but you have all these skills and you have an eye for some of this. And I'm not saying that I am like Matt Diavella level or any of these like other people that we like their videos and that are really well done. It's just that I know that I can do better, but I have this push and pull of is that time worth it being spent there? Because it doesn't attribute to our household having consistent revenue, which is we're, we're just in this place now, and some people I think have a different setup with how they're producing videos on YouTube where they have income coming in from clients or they have income coming in from other things. So YouTube is not necessarily something that they have to make money from or whatever. We don't have to make money from this by any means, but if we're gonna spend 10, 20 hours on it a week, I just want it to be fruitful in the way that it, it, it does things. And I do know that by having a more produced and more thoughtful video, it's going to get more views as opposed to doing these kind of informal videos well, without much Well, do you editing. actually know that? I have the data of the past six months of us doing our show. So what you just said was that more produced, you have the data that says that will get more views. I, I, and well, what I'm saying is more produced in that not just a show sitting us here talking. So like there's more of a story, there's more of, you know, we've thought about like what it, it's probably gonna be a little bit shorter. It's gonna be a lot more different uh, places where you film, like those types of things, what I'm saying. Not just in the multiple camera angles, higher quality. Uh -huh. I'm saying more production in the like, there's more things going on in the but video But how itself. many videos do we have of us just sitting and talking? Our entire show, 34. I'm really missing the mark on what you're saying. What, what I'm saying is, is that- This is a real time ships in the night miscommunication <laughs> that we often have that we have to work out. So let me try to understand it. Okay, so okay. the entire topic of last week's discussion yes. was, hey, we're gonna stop doing video for the show because it's just not growing in viewership. It's a lot of work for me. Yes. And I just don't feel like creatively, if that's the one video that we're potentially putting out on YouTube every week, it's not really showing the skills that we have. Okay. Again, okay. right? Like a okay. chef who is taking photos on his Instagram of the microwavable meals he's heating okay. up every okay. night. As opposed to, if we're gonna spend time doing video, then let's do shorter, more produced, more thoughtful. We talked about some ideas at the end of last week's video, some type of weekly recap of our lives. Oh, some but type I'm of thing. not saying don't do that. I'm I, saying, so don't bring that into the into the mix. I'm saying 
this format of like set up the tripod and film it and post it with no editing versus editing. So don't bring the other shorter videos into the mix. I know. So you're saying that they're separate videos then? What are separate videos? If we make the other types of videos that we talked about yeah. last week. Yeah. So my, but getting back to where this all started was the feedback that we got from people from last week's video, you challenging me to maybe be less thinking about production and things. What I'm saying is that I feel like that's what we've done for the past six months with our videos is less production, less thoughtful content, just our show, which is thoughtful, but it's just a singular camera sitting in things. Okay. We're ha this. I found. I found it. Oh, okay. I found the the ship in the night. The ship in the night. Yeah. The so ship. we're on a ship. I'm on a ship. And I'm on a ship. And then there's a third ship <laughs> that plastic no. goes by. His little paws and, and it the is wooden powered spindles. By farts. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I found the miscommunication. Okay. What do, you, what do you got? I thought that this conversation that we're having was about the specifically when we first sat down to start recording this episode of the podcast. I said, "Hey, I think somebody made a good point, which is that what if." we just set up the camera and actually visually recorded it as well. No editing, no nothing, whatever. So in my mind, I thought we were talking about the the potential of doing that versus the way that we've been filming it before, where we've like cared about the production of just the show, just the show. Right. You're talking about, you're YouTube now- YouTube as a strategy. Yes, you're yeah. now extrapolating this to talk about YouTube as a strategy. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying my whole thing about like challenging us to be imperfect was about this show, okay. this type of video. Which I totally understand. Also, this lighting is going to drive me nuts because it's changing. But hey, that's a good practice uh, for I still have to spend two hours on this, probably. Okay. So, but so again, so it goes- So for the video portion of this? Yes. Why? Because I have to import the footage, set up the file, do basic color correction and lighting. Because if I don't, it just looks terrible. No one's going to watch it. It's dark. So it has to be, it has to have some stuff done to okay. it. Okay. I mean, you, you have to agree. If you click on a YouTube video that's poorly lit or dark, you don't even watch those videos. You only watch videos from people who at least have some production value. You have to admit that. Any video I've ever watched you watch has some production value okay, to it. Okay, I'll give you that. So I have to do that. So then just in the setting up of the clip, syncing of the audio, adding our show card on the front, um, leaving just a little bit of like the music intro and outro, like that stuff, exporting, uploading, getting it ready for the, the page, writing the description, writing the title, all of that adds up into time uh -huh. and mental effort as opposed to what we talked about last week, which was the show just becomes a podcast. It's so much less production. I literally just drop the audio. It's good to go. Okay, well listen, then if that's how you feel about it, then we shouldn't do the video. Because I can hear it in your voice. It's not about whether it's worth it. It's not about this and that. It's that you don't want to invest the time in that. It's If it's not going to be... A, I just think it, I think it also comes down to human bandwidth for us. Like I know how draining it is for you to have well, these fine. conversations when as I, well. When I brought this up when we sat down, I was like, oh, that is a good point. Like why not? And you didn't explain all that. So now that you've explained all that... Great, we're not <laughs> gonna do it. Screw video. Well, just specifically, we're we're gonna stick with our decision to not do the show in video format, and we'll just do it in audio. That's fine. We we talked through it. Well, but now I'm not sure. Jason. <laughs> See, right. that was reverse psychology. I just tricked you. <laughs> Let's move forward into the topic. I, I took that it we away wanted. so that you know that you'd really want it. <laughs> That we wanted to talk about, and let's see. <laughs> let's see if, how if much we, of that you leave in. Right, if I end up just cutting that. Completely. I think it's interesting. I think the miscommunication is interesting. Ships in the night. Ships in the I night. I mean, Plaxico driving the ship with his little paws in the wooden spindle. With a little. <laughs> with a little butter farts <laughs> <laughs> blowing in the wind, just scooting right past just us. Scooting. It's because his boat's so small. That's why we couldn't of see him. Yeah. And yeah. we're in these big Titanic ships, and he's just in this little putter fart. I'm ship. only on the front of the ship being held up. That's my entire job, mm. like Rose. First of all, you know how I feel about this. You have not seen the movie Titanic, and you do not get to use memes from the movie if you uh, haven't seen I it. I like how many times this has come up in videos uh, that we've created. I know. Yeah. A recently, a date night idea that we had was watch was like movie swap, where like I have to choose a movie. I've told you this so many times. What? You do not want me to watch Titanic. I do. No, you don't. Yes, I'm gonna I be do. so bored. Number one. I don't two, know. mad, and three, yeah, bored and mad. With an attitude like that, you will be. 
if you go into it with an open mind, that is the rule of the date. You go into it with an I open mind. I know what happens. Rose has plenty of room on the door and she doesn't let Leo have the room and he dies. What did I say? <laughs> what did I say? Also, I saw this on Twitter recently where someone goes, uh, like, idea for any, or like somebody connect me with a pool float manufacturer stat. I've got a great <laughs> idea. And it's just the door from Titanic. Yeah. Which yeah. is great. I love yeah, that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the actual topic that we wanted to get into uh, is working with clients. Clients. And then also talking about BASFA, this idea that we're kind of putting out into the world these next couple weeks if you're not watching this. Uh, if you're watching, listening to this, however this is being done, <laughs> uh, a month from now, we that may not matter. But as of right now, we are going to be releasing this project for the next couple weeks where we're building a Squarespace site from start to finish. Yes. And we're calling it BASFA. That's my acronym. Because you just I turn everything acronyms. into an acronym. And part of that is because you wanted to get back into design. You're feeling better. Yes. You're feeling, you've recharged your batteries for six months. Very, like, difficult <laughs> way to recharge those batteries, by the way. Just going through an anxiety bout. Yeah. Wouldn't uh, recommend. But now, you know, wanting to do that, but then also going, okay, well, let's also kind of two birds, one stone this if we can. We want to do marketing stuff for Wandering Info that gets attention to our site and to people signing up for our newsletter and those types of things. But then also, if this can make us some money, we want to do that in a creative way. It's basically like check, check, check. Yeah. Like something I enjoy doing, check. Something that can be marketing for Wandering Aimfully because we document the process, check. Something that has the potential to bring income, check. Yeah. So. so I think one of the things we want to talk about are some of our experiences working with clients, how that's transitioned into where we are today, and then also just some ideas of things we've learned or things we would do if we owned client businesses right now. Because mm -hmm. we do have a bunch of people who listen to us who are aspiring to create client businesses that they want to do design for people. They want to do photography for people. They want to do things, but they don't even know where to start or they're, they feel like, Oh, everyone's already doing this. There's no way I could do it, which I just think is hilarious mm -hmm. because there's, that doesn't matter at all. And I then have... also, you know, it's kind of the good and the bad of, of what that's been mm -hmm. like for us. Um, if you want to know more about our backstory, I'm going to kind of gloss over that because we have entire podcast episodes related to sort of our Go business really fast. journey. Like real fast. No. Okay. No. Wow. Thank you for your offer, but I project it. Um, <laughs> like Leo, uh, or like Rose, Leo offered to get on the door. Listen to what I'm saying. And she was like, listen no, to what thank I'm you. No deal. Yeah. I've heard from the banker. You may and not. No deal. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Howie, Howie's, Howie on, yeah okay. Howie's on the tip of the Titanic. Okay. What? God, bring it back in. Rain it in. <laughs> Rain it in. Okay. So I started doing client work in 2013. So you are doing some backstory? Oh, I'm glazing over it. Just so you guys know, because we're not filming this. Maybe we are. <laughs> <laughs> I just did like scratch. Claw, you did like claw, claw hand. At you. Yeah. That was an involuntary response to you not letting me actually form sentences. Okay. In 2013, before I even started Made Vibrant, I was taking on design clients, client work. That was how I was making money. It was when I wore your shirt ended. January 2014, I turned it into a brand, Made Vibrant, and was doing design, again, client work. Um, there's a lot of things that we can talk about within that, but one that just came to mind, which is like a straight up tip, like a really th important thing that I learned. Like a claw tip? A claw tip. Okay. During that whole first year that I think people listening can take and run with right now is when I started Made Vibrant, I said, I just, I'm a designer. I said, and I said on my services page, I do, I can do brand design. I can do website design. I can do, um graphic design like wedding invitations or like any type of paper products like i just said i logo design i had all of these different all things, the things listed on my services page and it was really hard for the first six months to get clients like i had i mean i think i probably made a thousand bucks a month in that those first six months yeah which is nothing to you know it's a great start but it's not it's a great start but you can't really live off of a thousand dollars a month right yeah the big shift for me happened when I decided to niche down and say, okay, what uh, out of all of these design things that I've, and I do think it was important to start out that way so that I could get a variety of different types of projects so I could figure out what I liked the best. But for me, it was brand design for creative entrepreneurs. So usually solopreneurs, one woman shop, one man shop. And um, I liked turning their personality into a brand that I could turn into a website but really this custom brand design for creative entrepreneurs was the thing that I liked the most. And so I just, it felt very limiting, but I transitioned my brand to then speak to that all over my communications. So front and center on Made Vibrant's homepage, I said, 
I create custom brand design for creative entrepreneurs. That's what I said. My services were only those things. And the really important piece about this, if you're working with clients, is that you want to niche down to the point where in somebody's mind, you are the go-to person for that thing. So the problem was like, when I said I did it all, I was just sort of like a generalist and nobody was gonna be in a conversation with a friend who's like, oh, I need a wedding design invitation. They're gonna go to a wedding design invitation person or, oh, I'm gonna create a website. And they're like, oh, go to this website person. So they were never recommending me because I was just a generalist. And so the second that I really said, this is what I do, my client inquiries like increased a ton. Yeah. I didn't you cut can you speak off. now. Oh, okay, cool. Reverse Un- clawed. Unclawed. Unclawed. Un- unclawed. You can speak now are literally <laughs> the words that I said. Wow. Wow. Now, is it uncomfortable that I'm not speaking? Yes. Yeah. So that's a double-edged sword there, isn't it? <laughs> Doesn't want me to speak, but then uncomfy when I am speaking. No, uncomfy when you aren't speaking. So now I want you to speak. Oh, wow. This is great. No, I, I do. Th- I mean, as I watched you go through this evolution in working with clients, it was really interesting to see that. And back in when I had my client service business, I mean, we only really positioned ourselves as web designers and we just like, we'll just make a website for you. But then what ends up happening, which is the same thing that happened to you when Made Vibrant came around and you shifted to branding is someone goes, oh, hey, you guys are web designers. Can you also do a logo for me? Mm-hmm. And we go, yeah. And like for you, it was people would say, oh, can you also do some hand-drawn illustrations for me? Right. And you go, yeah, I can do that. And so these things start to naturally happen. But if you don't really hone in on that one thing that you can do and There was a really interesting conversation in our Wandering Aimfully Slack where Ray Chili asked this question and she was talking about niching down. She's like, everyone's talking about niching down. Like, I don't feel like I've got that kind of honed in. And so I tagged in a couple people who do client work and just had them respond. And it was a really interesting array of responses where some people said, oh, you got to niche down. And some people said, I don't care at all about niching down. And so I, I do think it almost matters to where you are in your journey of what you feel like if you feel super disconnected to what work you're putting out into the world because you just don't really know what it is, maybe you need to hone in further on what that is. But if you feel like, I can offer a wide array of services and I'm fine to be a generous, that's okay too. Well, yeah, and the important point to note about my personal anecdote is that being a generalist wasn't working for me. Exactly. So then try something different. So like, that's, yeah, don't, if someone... Don't get paralyzed in the beginning going, should yeah. I or shouldn't I? It's like, try something, and then if that doesn't work, consider... It's like the down. classic shiny object syndrome, right? It's like, if things are going fine, but then you're hearing people be like, you should niche down, be like, but things are going fine, like, you don't need to worry about it. Totally. Things are going fine. Yeah. So, but if things aren't going fine, then you have to make a decision to change those right. and try And that's things. the responsibility of everyone to take advice with a grain of salt and go, well, obviously I don't need to follow this because my business is doing fine. I have a question for you. Please. Why is it that we don't take on any clients anymore? So you stop taking on clients. Yeah. It, the biggest reason is because the first big flare up of anxiety that I had was in 2014. And that was... The stress of working with clients. The stress of working with clients. And part of this is kind of a personality trait that I... Not a genetic weakness. (laughs) If anyone who (laughs) listens to our anxiety episode will know what that means. Um, You know, I think it might be different because I think I've done a lot of inner work the past couple of years in order to not be so tied to the expectations of other people and rising to meet those. Um, I think it could be actually an interesting challenge, but... The, the short answer was that it caused a lot of anxiety and sleepless nights and just feeling like I was never good enough and feeling like I wanted to over deliver every time. And so I was working these crazy hours to the point where if you took the how much money I was getting paid for the project because I wasn't watching my time very efficiently and divided it over the amount of hours I was spending, I was making like, you know, less than eight bucks an hour or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And um, so so the answer is I wasn't at the place in my personal work and in my professional habits that I could, help, in a healthy way, manage a client business. Yeah. I think, I still think even today, even with like customers that we have for digital products, like those people aren't clients, but I think when there has to be back and forth between, mm-hmm. it's like your least favorite thing. Yes. and And I think that that's a really important point about building a business based on knowing who you are, Yeah. you know? And so this actually brings up a good point about the whole building a Squarespace site from start to finish project that we're doing, that we're doing because, um, 
that was actually this interesting accident that happened where I said, I want to build websites again because I want to scratch that itch. But is there some type of creative way that we can think about selling this in a way that doesn't require working with a client back and forth? Yeah. And plus for me as a creative person, it takes a lot of the fun out of it because as much as I do love the challenge of trying to, I do really enjoy the challenge of taking a person and seeing kind of figuring out what their essence is and then building that and bridging that into a visual language. I love that part. But the back and forth that happens where your vision kind of gets diluted based on sometimes arbitrary things that they like or don't yeah. like, or sometimes they can't see the vision. Um, and, and that's not to like put any type of blame on working with clients or anything. It's just any creative person knows that your your vision is going to get diluted working with a client. That's just how compromise goes. So with this project, we thought, is there a way to build a website without like so that I could just completely unfiltered build the thing that I wanted to build and then sell it after. Yeah. And I know that's a very unconventional way to do it. It's a little yeah. bit yeah. 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 Yes. It's a little bit more conventional nowadays with like a lot of these branded templates that you can buy. But we decided to kind of take that model, which I really like, but I've never thought was that economical because you have to build all these templates and you don't even know if they're going to sell. Right. So kind of taking the best from that model, taking the best from like a custom website model and saying like, is there a creative way to remix these ideas together and come up with a, a different way to sell that, yeah. which, which is what we're doing. Yeah. And I, I do think this is like the classic example for us of trying to do something differently and trying to think differently, which is, okay, so the template thing, it, it can work for a lot of people and you know, we love digital products. So that's an example of a digital product and you can sell that asset over and over again, hopefully, which is great. Um, for us, what we wanted to do was go, okay, well, what if we took the idea of a template per se, but it's custom, it only exists one time, mm -hmm. but then it's also not just a, here's all the assets, now you go figure it out. It's let's go one step further and build the actual full website so that someone can literally have the entire website built on Squarespace and all they have to do is potentially change the name in the font and of the their logo copy. and their copy. But like, I just mean like the one quick change for it to be theirs. Yeah. And, and I just think it's such an interesting idea. And then also to layer on top, we're showing the behind the scenes of how that works. And, and so really the, the client side of this for us is we just want how we're going to sell it is I think going to be really interesting in, in a couple of weeks when that happens, someone's going to essentially end up buying it and we get to find out, okay, well, how much is this worth to people? And what we can extrapolate out from that is it took us, let's say one week of work, one 40 hour work week to do this. Um, if you work with a client, incredibly rarely are you going to work with a client for one 40 hour work week. Right. So let's say on average, just from our experience, it's four to eight weeks of 40 hour work weeks on the minimum for a client for this brand and website, you know, build. And you might get paid, I don't know, $10,000. Like I just throw a random number out there. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but that's two months of work. Essentially we're doing one week of work. And if we can make whatever it ends up selling for and then go, all right, well, we can do this again. We can do this a couple of times. We can, just spin these up. But we, the beautiful thing is that we don't have the back and forth. Mm -hmm. We don't have the stress that you get, uh, you know, kind of put under when you have to deal with people and all that stuff. And also we get to just kind of create from a place of joy and just have fun and you get to do whatever you want. And then we get to sell it in a fun way that's different. And hopefully it promotes everything else we're doing. We're going to see. It's yeah. That. But and, that's and, the idea. And that is the wandering aim fleet ethos in action yeah. for this idea, for this thing that we're doing. Um, but okay, so I do want to come back to clients yeah. um, and I want to talk but about- So the, just to tie that up with a bow, the whole reason that we went down that train of thought is because I want to challenge people who are listening right now to think about their client process and consider the aspects that they don't like about it and to, to maybe be creative about, is there a way that they can package their services or sell their products in a way that's very different and unconventional that maybe even removes the things that they don't like about the process? Or on the other side, let's say that your least favorite part is like the client feedback part or sending invoices. I mean, I think so many creative people struggle with the business side mm -hmm. of running a business. So it's like sending invoices, managing all that stuff. Can you find someone to take that on for you? Yeah. And and replace that part of it for you and you just get to stay in your little zone of genius that you live in. And yeah, you do have to pay someone else to manage that, but you can find someone to hourly do that who they like doing that part of it. Yep. Two more quick ideas that claw, just, are they claw tips? Claw tips. Okay. They're not tips, but they're examples of this. Right. Um just going back to this whole, you know, rethink your process and be creative about your process. I remember when I first stumbled across um a designer 
whose business is called Ellen Company. Yeah. And she was one of the first people I saw online doing this very unique idea, which was client websites in two weeks, mm -hmm. which was super interesting. And it's in a very, very short, compressed time frame on a very specific schedule. Basically, if you, if you book her... Um, at least this is how it was when I read the blog post way back when, if you book her, you know that for those two weeks, you have to be available for immediate feedback and you have your coffee ready and you have all these things. And that was a very unique way for her to transition her process so that she wasn't dragging out these long sites. Cause as designers know, that sometimes happens. A project just drags out yeah. and drags out. So that was one example that I think is interesting of just creating your own process to maybe reduce some of the friction. And then another one that I saw recently was a blog post on a designer who said, this is why I don't do mood boards anymore. And she doesn't do mood boards. She does like brand exploration boards or something where it's sort of a mixture of like, here's where we can take the logo. Here's just my in initial ideas about fonts and things. It skips the whole mood board pro like point in the process because I guess in her experience, a lot of times her clients were having a hard time seeing Got how it. that was going to relate to the relate. brand. Yeah. And I thought that was interesting. Um, I still really like the mood board yeah. um, process, but again, just completely looking at your process and going, what are the sticking points and is there a unique way around them? Yeah. Uh, okay. So the one thing I think we definitely wanted to talk about on this was some more claw tips, which was claw tips. the thing that we talk about all the time. If we were to start a design business or a photography business or any type of client business where you have some type of work that you can show to a potential client to land that client. And you have zero clients. And you have zero clients. And you're or just getting started. Maybe you've had some clients and you just, you know, the well has run dry and you're feeling like, I'm not getting, you know, I, I don't have anybody to reach out to. What do I do now? And this is this is our foolproof idea. So eventually we're going to create probably a video about this. We're mm -hmm. going to create an article about this. But we've been talking about this a lot kind of together and not in separate, like in public ways, essentially. And I think it's kind of funny that we haven't done that. But Here's what that looks like. So let's say that you are a web designer. That's, I'm just gonna, we're gonna tee this back and forth, all right? So right. you're a web designer. Oh, is, this, is this what role play is? <laughs> oh, I think so. Do I need to change clothes? <laughs> Do I need to dress as a web designer? Hold on. Do I need to wear? I did it. Okay. Um, you're, uh, so you're a web designer and you live in Kansas City. Great. Let's say that's, that's where you are. Barbecue. And you're going, I have no clients. Where do you start? We're gonna go back and oh, forth. Oh, we're going back Remember when I said back and forth? We did role play, we're <laughs> going go back and forth. Where do I start? Yeah. I think that I, in my head, think of a couple of businesses around town. Interesting. That I like. Yeah. That I feel inspired by. Yeah. But who have terrible websites. Like restaurants. Restaurants are a great one. They have terrible websites. Maybe the salon you go to the or the salon. barber shop or whatever. These are great examples. Local like retail shops. Yeah. They typically have good websites. But, but you know, you never know. To me, the Mecca is restaurants because... It's always hard to find their menus. There's not a lot of information you need from that website. Yep. And so the um, upside is very So what you do is you make a, you open up a spreadsheet. And as much as creative people hate spreadsheets, you open one up. And you list out 10 to 20 of these businesses that you like, you know have bad websites, and that you could improve upon. Yep. Then you sit down and you go, okay, I'm going to give myself one hour or two hour, whatever's realistic for you, and I'm going to redo their homepage. I'm just going to their redesign homepage. their homepage. Maybe and gonna, in Squarespace, maybe in what your your XD, whatever you want to do. Choice. Yeah, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't have to fully function as a website. It's just, I just want to make it look better and and solve the problem that they're trying to solve. Yeah. And so I'm looking at this restaurant's website. It's really hard to find the phone number. Boom, up at the top, phone number. I was just about to say, really important. Make sure you have one or two functional things yep. in your redesign that you can point to and say this is going to actually increase because you can traffic go. Or hey, business. I I go to your website and I look for if you're a restaurant your menu and it's buried in mm -hmm. a, a thing I have to click and all this stuff. It's like that's one of the few things that should just be readily available and everywhere. Hours. Yeah. So you set those things up and, and let's say you do five of them. So you just give yourself one week, maybe you spend 10 total hours, two hours per day on this. Maybe you have one other client you're still working with. Then what do you do? Then. Nice. Good job. Tossed it back to you. You take these websites. Wings and learn to fly again. And you can do two things. You can either email, you try to find a contact person and say, hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm a web designer. Um, try not to sound spammy because I get a lot of those, whatever. Yeah, but like, I hey, actually, I live like, in Kansas City. I, live in Kansas I come City to your restaurant. And I love your restaurant. And I actually just the other day 
noticed that I couldn't find the, the menu and I thought, hey, I would just give you some tips on how to improve your website. I actually created what I would do for your homepage. Uh, you know, let me know if you want to chat more about maybe working together to make these improvements to your website. Yep. So you you put that email together, you send that email out to five, 10, however many people you do this for. And here is a very important step. A week later, if you don't hear back, you follow up. Yep. And this is such a crucial point that people forget all the time. Yep. They'll send the first email and maybe they'll they'll do any of this outreach and then they don't hear back and they give up. Yep. And they go, oh, they weren't interested. They didn't like they it. They didn't like it. They hated my work. I'm the worst designer of all time. They thought I was so annoying that I reached out to them. False. What happens is that restaurant owner is busy. The busy. salon owner is busy. They got hair they gotta cut. They got food they gotta cook. They got people they have to manage. They don't always look at their email. And if they do, maybe they're skimming it in bed and they're like, oh, I'll get back to that tomorrow. Then guess what happens tomorrow? The restaurant catches on fire and they have to deal with that in like a nice way though. In like a just good- Just like a, a controlled fire. Yeah, it's like a controlled yeah. fire. Uh, like those, overcooked. Like yeah. you just do a quick fire extinguisher. Yeah, well an overcooked too, we then you scuttle over, really quickly. We haven't played overcooked in I know, so long. We need to. We need to. Uh, so you follow up. So a week later you send an email, just reply to your original email and go, hey, restaurant owner, blah, 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 just following up. I know you get busy. We all, you know, like, I just want to pop this up to the top of your inbox. I know you're busy. I know you're busy. Uh, do you want to have a quick chat? I could even come down to the restaurant for a time that works for you and we could just talk about this if you think it's a good fit. And if you don't hear back after that email, if you're a go-getter, you can send- And you're brave. One more follow-up. Yeah. If you wanted to send one maybe like a week later, just be like, hey, just one more chance here. Again, know you're busy. And they could write back and go, oh my gosh, my restaurant's been on fire for the past two <laughs> weeks. Like it's a control fire, uh, but I had to take care of it. And thank you so much for following up. Yes, please come in, let's talk about this. Yeah, and I, what I was gonna say too is if you're brave and you really are at a place where you're like, I have nothing to lose, I'm not getting any clients. These are places in your town, walk right in, to the front door. With your little scuttly talk feet. Talk to someone and say, hey, um, like probably choose, for example, at a restaurant, maybe choose like a four o'clock hour or, or right when the dinner, it, not during the dinner rush, yeah. go early when there's not gonna be a lot of people and say, hey, do you have like a floor manager that I can speak to? Um, you know, and a lot of times they'll say, sure, and bring your laptop, bring your iPad, show visuals of what you would do and just say, hey, if you wanna chat more, like, Maybe even um, say, can I get your email address? I'll send you these images and start the open line of communication. Yeah, and and the beauty of this is that you're showing, not telling someone what you can do exactly. for them. So you're saying, I already did the work. This is how I would improve this. And your hope is that that person is so busy that they go, oh my God, you're right. I have wanted to redo our website. We haven't redone it since 2007. And Guaranteed, like 60% of the people you contact know that their website is shitty. How'd you pull 60% out of curiosity? I just decided. Yeah, more than 50. I think I even said the word guaranteed, which is like, yeah, I cannot- Yeah, you really <laughs> did, wow. 60% of those people know their website is shitty already. They just don't have the time because you're busy to busy. do it. And so this is one very important point about like, ultimately understanding how to get what you want, not get what you want out of somebody, but you have to put yourself in their shoes and go, how do I make their job easier? Yeah, and, and I do think that a lot of this stems from putting yourself out there a little bit and maybe putting a little bit uncomfortable in doing work that you're not getting paid for and you may not get a return on it. But here's the thing, if you have a client business, if you're a web designer, if you're a photographer, like it, it works for all of these different things. If you're showing what you're trying to do and solving someone's problem for them and just putting yourself out there, maybe they don't need a website now, but maybe they remember you when six months from now the rest restaurant isn't on fire anymore. Or maybe they're out to drinks with their restaurateur friends. Oh, wow. And one of them says, I know this website sucks. And they go, oh, this kid came into my restaurant. And well, it doesn't have to be a kid. They could be an adult. I know, but just, I'm trying to be a restaurateur. We're oh, role playing. And they're, yeah. they're gonna say like, some kid came oh, into my wow. restaurant. And, Is he know. also a newsboy owner? <laughs> like a newsboy restaurant? There's a kid in my restaurant and he keeps coming in with a website. I don't even know what a computer is. <laughs> Are you this, so good at that voice? That's such a specific thing. You can do it. Get no! this a little bit. Come on. <laughs> you can do it. Extra, extra. Read all about it. Okay, yeah. Now, but now say something that's like contextual to the conversation. <laughs> Throw a shrimp on the body. <laughs> wow. Wow. I'm just trying to think of all of my Your little colloquialism. Is that what a clo clo colloquialism is? That's a hard word to say. Yeah, that would be an example. A colloquialism is just something that the locals say. Oh, nice. God, I'm smart. The Kansas City locals. Around here, we always say these things about shrimps and bobbies. <laughs> um, so that's that's our like foolproof 
get clients, if you're trying to if get you clients, just are like, I have no money. You have to put yourself out there. You have to do outreach. And here's the beautiful thing is that it may feel like that time is wasted if you don't get clients, but hopefully the underlying part of this is you're still honing your skill. By the way. So you're still doing web design. Yes. You're still taking photos. You're still getting, yes. you're getting experience and you can use that experience to then hopefully keep moving forward in Plus, your business. couldn't you also use it in your portfolio? <laughs> words use it in your portfolio and say this is spec work for totally, a local restaurant blah, I mean blah, that's blah. what I think that's what dribble is in itself right it's, it's a whole bunch of people who let have, me redesign the uh, airline tickets I've seen that before. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me redesign airline tickets <laughs> your nail you... mine like drifts into Mickey Mouse like really just... uh -huh, yeah let me let me redesign these airline tickets. How many more voices can you do? We've been over this. I can do more than we think. Okay. Yeah. What else you got? We're gonna do it right now. I don't know. Try uh, Irish. That's hard. Ah, uh, the luck of the Irish. You, it, no, yeah, no, no, no. You can't go leprechaun. Uh, well, that's where it always has to start for me. Yeah. Yeah, I can't. That's hard. Irish, English, and Australian are all they're too close together. I'm for much me. better at like. I can mimic sound, so like yeah. if I hear a person, I can mimic the sound. Well, that's like but if you have a friend air. who comes over from, let's say, like I don't know, Spain. By the time they leave, <laughs> you're speaking with a slight didn't, Spanish accent. Didn't we hear that Kristen Bell has this affliction as well? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a real thing. I think yeah. it's like a brain thing. I need more time. I don't spend enough time working on impressions to be able to do like <laughs> rattle them off quickly. But there are a couple of go tos that I always have. Like Christopher Walken. Uh, Kermit the Frog. I can usually turn that one on pretty quickly. Kermit the Frog. What that's you gotta close. do is you gotta build a website. Okay, that's yeah. really just cadence, is what that is. But that's pretty much all Barack what Obama? Walken is. I've never tried to do Barack Obama. Well, his is a cadence one too. You just gotta get the cadence right, and then you're good. Uh, Michelle is my wife. It's not bad. And yes, we can. <laughs> Okay, it, it's I don't not, do it enough. I want I to be it clear. It's yeah. not bad, but it's not good. Yeah, uh, it, yeah I agree. Okay. I agree. Anywho. Whew, tangent. <sighs> uh, so yeah, that is our foolproof client thing. I think it works for uh, brand designers, web designers, illustrators, photographers, really anybody who does a visual skill set of some sort for people for money. You can put yourself out there and do it. And what I will say is... We all hear these stories of successful people who got hundreds of no's in whatever they were trying mm -hmm. to do. Seth Godin, 700 publishers he heard no from, whatever. J.K. Rowling, like all the publishers in our, like I know these are gigantic names and maybe you're not trying to be at that level or scope, but what you have to realize is you are going to hear no throughout your entire life, your entire career, and you just have to be willing to accept the fact that that is part of it. Mm -hmm. And especially if you are not getting work and you're not getting paid and you're not making money, you have to do something to have that happen. You can't just sit back and cross your fingers and go, yeah. well, I've spent years being X. I think I should get some money at some point for it. It's like, it doesn't work like that, especially now. And and I had a conversation with my buddy Greg on new podcast that's coming out. Shout out, new podcast coming Shameless out. Shameless plug. Not really, because I'm not even going to mention it. But we talked a lot about this where he just said and acknowledged, like, it's so much harder nowadays to stand out, to run a business, to do these things. But, but at the same time, it's also easier than it's ever been. So it's a little bit of a conflicting statement. Well, yeah, it's easier to get started and maybe it's harder to stand out. I think the exact quote was, it's easier to get started, it's harder to succeed. Oh, I like that. Yeah, and that's because Greg's really smart. And so yeah, he said that. And yeah. succinct. Uh, and but, handsome. Okay, and all right. self-disciplined and like just really creative. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. You good? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I do think that that is just acknowledging those things you're going to hear no it's going to be difficult to succeed it's going to like that is all stuff that you just have to accept yeah or so this is kind of like the tangent or the the kind of like next Caveat? direction of this what? uh the next transition transition the segue which is what we both done which is we don't do client work anymore <laughs> right and we switched over to digital products memberships software other things creative weird projects like i've done and you make money in different ways and you try different things that people aren't doing or they are doing and you do it in your own flavor. And that becomes an opportunity for you to chase down creating a life for yourself and creating revenue and income for yourself that doesn't have to be the way that it's always been done. I maintain that every person who d does a client business, whether they want to stop doing client work or not, should create a digital product because it gives you 
A, I think it puts your own process under a microscope, and I think that's always a good thing. So you have to like think about how you do things in order to teach it to other people. So a lot of people are, you know, oftentimes caught up in the way that they've done something and it's almost automatic and they don't take a step back and look at it. So that's one reason. Two, I think that even if it's not making you a ton of money, the idea of diversifying your revenue stream, sometimes like, like Jason was saying, you know, when my lettering course first started, just that little bit of, you know, a thousand dollars a month of revenue was enough in the early days that I could take on one less client. And maybe that one less client was one that I didn't really want to be working with. It didn't light me up. So if you have, if you're working with five clients and only, you know, three of them are your ideal clients, if you can start bringing in some product revenue, maybe you can kind of cut off the other two and transition that money into the digital product space. And all of a sudden you're a lot happier because you're only working with clients that you love. Um, so I think every person, I think it's just a good experiment to try and build a digital product. Well, and it, it the word that I use all the time with this is it's an asset. Exactly. So a client is not a long-term asset for most of us. It's not a renewable resource for it's, you. It's usually a one and done, or maybe they come back around, or maybe it's kind of like a longer term, but there is an eventual end to it, as mm -hmm. opposed to some type of digital product, some templates, an online course, a digital book of some sort, a membership community, uh, any of these things that are kind of like workshops, video workshops, any of this stuff that could be sold to many people over and over again, it is an asset that you can leverage time and time again. And a lot more people can pay you for it than can pay you to be clients because you only have so much time you can trade for money. Yeah, the other point that I wanted to make about client work in general that isn't that related to digital products, but about getting clients is, I think most people know now that putting your work out there is essential to people understanding what your skill set is and what you can do. I think pretty much everyone understands now you need to put your work out there on social media in order to get more clients. What I don't think as many people do, which takes that one step further, is to show your process and document your process. I think a lot of creatives are afraid to do this because they think that like people are gonna steal their special sauce or maybe it's gonna open them up for criticism. But this is one thing that I always, it came very naturally to me, is just I was developing my own little processes to think to things and then I wanted to share that with people. Like here's a trick that I, here's how I do this, whatever. And Like a claw tip. A claw tip. And for anyone who struggles with imposter syndrome, I think this is one of the best things that you can do for yourself because the more that you make up your own processes and you kind of flip that on its head. So in a way you're doing it your own way and you're like, is this the right way? But if you take that and instead of coming at it from a place of, is this the right way? And you kind of embody this empowerment mindset, which is, th well, this is how I do it. And you kind of share that with confidence. People suddenly aren't like, oh, you're not qualified to do this. And they're like, oh, they must know something that I don't know because yeah. this is a really unique way to do this. Yep. And um, I, the more that I did that, the, the less I felt like an imposter because I felt like I was doing things my own way. And that actually is if someone's going, okay, you guys, you just talked about this digital product thing. How do I know when the timing is right for me to make a digital product? And what you've talked about before is when I've honed my own processes, Process. when I have my own ways of doing things that feel unique to me. And that is why we think starting with a client business, working with a bunch of clients, developing your own processes, then it's the right time to make a digital product as opposed to a lot of people are like, That's true. I'm a designer, which just means you have like have a subscription to Photoshop and you're like, I'm just going to make a course. It's like, you've never even worked with a design client yet. You just see the opportunity of, I want to teach design through a course. Whereas when you work with a bunch of clients, you learn, Oh, this is how people are learning. These are the things that they actually need. These are the processes I use to, to have an end result come of my work. And that leads into a digital product makes sense as opposed to starting from the beginning when you don't even know your process or anything else. And when you're just sort of regurgitating information at that point. Which we don't love regurgitation around here. That's right. We, we like really don't. Putting your unique spin on it. Yeah. All right. Anything else you wanted to talk about with clients? I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, I do think that they're one of the things that we, you touched on this a little bit, but it is not to feel like you should abandon your clients and move to digital products as fast as possible. Like it's not something that we want people to do. It's not something that we've done. We've always bridged the gap and made that transition Gradually. in a way that felt right to us. <clears throat> right. But uh, also if you can find a unique way to do this as well, that doesn't involve all the stuff you don't like, like our build a Squarespace site from start to finish project, where we're hoping to use a lot of the things that we really like 
um, to share a bunch of the stuff that we do really well. A lot of the process stuff is gonna be shared. I mean, almost all of it. And our hope is that at the end of it, someone buys it, we make some money, and then we can just do another one. And this can be something that we end up doing that's different, it's unique to us, and we're not gonna do it forever, but it's something that is just interesting and we'll see where it goes. And it's kind of a fun wandering game for the experiment. For sure, love those experiments. Yeah, I just remembered, I forgot to get it and Googled that for you. I'm so sorry. Uh, we'll do it next time. I know. I, I, as we were talking about this, I was like, oh, I wonder if there's anything. And I was like, that's nah, fine. People will be okay. We, they can Google things for themselves for a week. <laughs> for two weeks. Yes, yeah. two weeks. That's yeah. true. Uh, all right. Well, whether this was up on video or not, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, we are excited for you guys to follow along our little build project. It will most likely live at wanderinginfly.com slash build. But if for some reason you can't find it there, uh, you'll be able to find it. Just, you know, look around. I just realized it's a little bit confusing because build.wanderinginfly.com already exists. And yeah, but I don't think people know, like, remember that. That's more for us when we transition over. Anyway, don't, don't. Don't okay. confuse people with that okay. little nugget. Uh, either way, you'll find it probably on my Twitter or your Instagram or wherever. Like, it'll be somewhere. You'll be able to find it. Um, yeah, we hope you uh, appreciated us chatting about client stuff. Hope you got something from it. Um, if you have any incredible, amazing tips to help people get clients, feel free to send them along to us and we'll pass them along uh, maybe in a follow-up episode about clients. We'll definitely be doing some follow-ups about the BASFA project yes. to keep people up to date on that. Uh, yeah, and that's that's all I have as I recap everything Let's here. Let's go make lunch. Ooh, what are we having? Salad. Titanic salad? Ooh. Can we call it the Rose Didn't Make Room for Leo salad? What else do you know about the movie Titanic? The we boat, did this in our Santa Barbara The video. boat do goes down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're not yeah. doing it again. Okay, if you want to watch what I know about uh, Titanic, go watch our road trip to Santa Barbara video uh, on the YouTube channel that we have for Morning Aimfully about a year ago. Yeah, Yeah, great. that was fun. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye.